for joining us this morning. And if you weren't here last week, and most of us were, but if you weren't here last week, I want you to know last week's message was the first part of the second part series. And the lesson last week was called, or the message last week was called lesson. Today we're going to be looking at the test. We'd also ask you, because Jennifer's done such a good job on our website, to go and check that out. We've got some new features on there. There's a button that comes up that says Listen and Learn. If you, you press that, it'll take you right to our YouTube channel. And you can watch all the messages on there. There's also a key on there that you can go to and see all our messages. And that'll take you to our YouTube channel as well. We've got some new features coming up in the next couple weeks that you'll hear about as well. So uh, I just want to take time to thank Jennifer for all of her work, hard work. So you can go to www.theodysseychurch.com or you can go to youtube.com forward slash the Odyssey Church and watch all our messages there. And if you are in an impossible situation, if you're in a situation right now that looks impossible, that just doesn't seem that you have enough, I would really encourage you, if you didn't hear last week's message, to go back and hear that. And maybe it's your, your children, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's uh, your health, whatever it is, if the situation looks impossible, maybe God is trying to do something in your life right now. Maybe there's a reason... And it's not always the case. We live in this fallen world. But maybe there's a reason that you're going through what you're going through. Because here's what we know. Our God is a God of compassion. Our God is a God of miracles. Our God is a God of abundance. And even though each lesson stands on its own, last week's message just shed a little bit of light on this week's message. Now, now you've heard me say before, I'm sure you already realize this, especially if you've read your Bible uh, a little bit, or even know just a little bit about Jesus. Jesus is the world's greatest teacher as ever known. He, he is just the master communicator, the master teacher. And he's always trying to teach us a lesson sometimes. Or uh, he's always trying to teach us a lesson, but sometimes he does it in the form uh, of a way that we don't completely understand. It's something that doesn't look like a lesson. And he loves us. He, and he loves us so much, he loves us not to test us. Jesus teaches us this truth. He teaches us this lesson. He gives us a principle. But he loves us too much not to let us know if we've learned the material he's trying to teach us. When God is trying to teach you something, when, expect the test. If you're going through something and, and he's trying to teach you something, you can always expect a test. He comes in, he gives us this lesson, and then he gives us a test to see if we've learned whatever it is that he's trying to teach us. See if we've learned the point. And, and one of the things, when I was in school, I, I just thought that a teacher gave you a test so that the teacher would know if you learned the lesson. And that is true to some degree, but the test is not for the teacher. The test is always to reveal the heart of the student to the student. To reveal to the student whether they learn whatever it is they want us to know. And Jesus is no different. He teaches us so that we can know our own hearts. He already knows our hearts, but he wants us to know our hearts as well. Right. So last week, we, we started in chapter 14. And what we learned in the beginning of chapter 14 is that Jesus had just gotten some bad news. Jesus had just heard that his friend, his cousin, the one that was supposed to pave the way for him, the one that did pave the way for him, the one who had baptized him, John the Baptist had just been executed on the orders of King Herod. And we know from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus and his disciples had been working so hard that they hadn't had time to even eat. They were tired. They were hungry. Jesus had just gotten some bad news. And I don't know whether you've ever felt this way, but Jesus just wanted to get away by himself. And sometimes, I, I think I co-mentioned it last week, when I... When I start preparing for these messages, God sort of makes me sort of live them out sometimes. Last week, week before last, was, was just a, a, a really tough week. A lot of meetings, a lot of things going on. Uh, it was a difficult week, and I said, Monday, I am going to get away by myself, and I am going to sit down, and I'm going to do nothing. 6 a.m., I look at my emails, and there's a message that says, what time is the meeting at the Odyssey Church today? And it came to me. We had planned a meeting. And then I had to go to Bethany. We had, uh, some really great news is taking place down in Bethany. The ministry, which is the, the local churches, is putting it together. And we we're hoping to have a, a homeless shelter up and running within the next two weeks. 
And I need to go meet with the chief of police and the, and the town manager and some other people to get that together. And all of a sudden, the day that I wanted to take off and, and just have this wonderful day of peace became a work day. And it wasn't only a work day. It started early in the morning and it got done late at night. Well, Jesus is the same way, except he's gotten this terrible news on top of everything else. And, and what we see is Jesus said, I'm going out. I'm going to take my disciples. I'm going to get away by ourselves. And he gets in a boat. He crosses over the sea. But by the time he gets there, his disciples had followed him around the other side. And they meet him. And, and they're there. And it's a huge crowd according to the Gospel of Mark. According to the Gospel of Matthew as well. And the people had brought more work for him. They brought their sick. And the first words we saw was, Jesus had compassion on them and he healed their sick. First thing we saw, our God is a God of compassion. God's going to say, he, he didn't just get away by enough. He stopped that and he went out and, and he started to heal the sick and meet with the people. And then towards the end of the day, what we find is, is the people are getting hungry. And, and, and they've been there all day and his disciples come to him and say, uh, you know, it's late in the afternoon. These people are hungry and you got to send them away. Jesus sent them into the other villages. Let them get something to eat. And Jesus simply says, I don't have to do that. You feed them. Now, again, sometimes my mind probably works different than a lot of you. So I, I'm seeing Jesus and, and the disciples that sort of, you know, when you want to talk to somebody and you don't want to tell everybody else, you get them off to the corner by yourself and they're going, Jesus, we don't have enough food. You really need to stop the services now and get them out of here and get to the village. And, and Jesus goes, okay, um, we don't really need to do that. You go feed them. Huh? And can you imagine the disciples, they're probably sitting there thinking to themselves, um, which one of us is going to tell Jesus? Who, by the way, says he's God, that he doesn't know what he's talking about, that we got five loaves of bread that we can round up and two fish, and that it's an impossible situation. We can't feed them. But Jesus takes what little bit they have, and we find out not only is he the God of compassion, but he's the God of miracle. He lifts it up, he blesses it, he gives it back to his disciples, and says, Now we'll feed them. Jesus takes what little bit we have, and, and he blesses it, he multiplies it. But he doesn't leave it and take care of all the work himself. You know, he could have provided man. He could have dispersed the food. He could have taken away the people's hunger. He didn't do any of that. He made the disciples go back and do part of the work, didn't he? See, sometimes we learn that, that without us, Jesus won't. We can't do it on our own without Jesus, but together we can take care of a lot of things, can't we? But not only is he the God of compassion, he's also the God of miracles. Because they had more after they were done than what they started with. Jesus takes this impossible situation. He'll do the same thing in your life. You may have a situation right now in your life that is impossible as feeding 20,000 people. It says 5,000 men plus their, their women and their children. And, and most commentaries agree there were at least 20,000 people there. Some say as many as 50,000. And he fed them. Five loaves of bread and two fish. And maybe you've got a situation in your life right now that's just as impossible. And you just need to release it. You need to turn it over to Jesus. You need to lay it in His hands so He can bless it, so He can multiply it. Because He's the God of compassion. He's the God of miracles. He's the God of abundance. He can take an impossible situation and make it plenty. Now, in Matthew 19.26, it says, With man... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Without Jesus, there's some things we can't do. Without us, there's some things Jesus won't do. But when we, two of us work in union together, when we're in Christ and He's in that, there is nothing that's impossible for us. So the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach them through the 5,000 loaves, or I'm sorry, the 5,000 men plus their husband and their wives through the five loaves and the two fish was that we need to trust Him even when the situation looks impossible. And we know that the disciples were tested in the loaves and the fish, and that they, or that it was the lesson, and the test is coming up, and we know they failed the test, because in the Gospel of Mark again, it says, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. And, and I think to myself, after all that we read in the scripture that Jesus had taught them, after everything they had seen, they still hadn't learned 
to trust him when the situation looked impossible. But then I look at my own life. I, I don't know about you, but I've been in an impossible situation, and yet I'm still here. I've been in some possible situations that the outcome did not come out the way I thought it would. But the God of miracles, the God of abundance, the God of compassion took care of it and it ended up being better than what I had hoped for. Amen. Amen. So how about you? Is anybody in here in an impossible situation? Every day. On your own, you can't handle it. Without Jesus, you can't do it. And without you inviting Jesus into it, he may not. But when you trust Him, when you place what little bit you have in His hands, He becomes the God of miracles, the God of abundance. And He takes what we have and He multiplies it and He blesses it. Jesus teaches His disciples to trust Him in the feeding of 5,000, but He loves them too much not to test them to see if they learn the lesson. You know, 2,000 years later, He's still trying to teach His disciples to trust Him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes He has to place us in a test. So if you have your Bible this morning, again, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. We're just going to pick up the reading today where we left off last week. We left off on verse 21. Last week was going to start in 20, verse 22 today. It says immediately after this, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side while he sent the people home. Now I want you to notice when the test came. It wasn't a couple years later. It wasn't a couple months later. It wasn't a couple days later. Sometimes when Jesus is trying to teach us something, the test comes immediately. And see, here, here, here's one of the things, and maybe I'm a little off subject here, but I, I just thank God he didn't give up on his disciples. When, when you start reading the record, you see how many times the disciples had lost trust in Jesus, that they didn't trust him to do the impossible. But Jesus keeps coming back and teaching them the lesson over and over again. I thank God he didn't give up on the disciples, because I thank God he didn't ever give up on me. There are some lessons he's been trying to teach me for years. But I know He is a God of compassion. And He won't give up on me and He won't give up on you either. After spending some time, after sending them home, He went up into the hills by Himself to pray. Night fell while He was there. And again, this isn't the key point of the message, but I do want to point this out. If Jesus, who is God, has to take time out to pray to God the Father, how much more should we have to take time out to pray to God the Father? If Jesus had to pray, I think what he's doing is he's given us this living example for us, his disciples, and for his disciples then to show us that without God, there's nothing that we can do that's going to bring him glory. We need to invite God into our situations we need to learn to communicate with God. He's trying to teach us a lesson to trust Him. And how can you trust somebody you don't know? And how can you know someone that you don't communicate with? See, one of the things we need to do is we need to learn to trust God in the very good times. We need to communicate with Him and we need to get to know Him so we have complete trust in the hard times. Because all of us have hard times, don't we? Jesus is trying to teach us to trust Him. But we need to spend time in prayer with Him so that we know Him. And we don't come to Him like a spare car. We just pull Him out of the trunk when we need Him. We don't come to Him like a genie in a bottle where we, we sort of have some difficult things and we rub the bottle and ask Him to come out and help us and take care of our problems. We need to get to know Him in the good times so that we can trust Him in the hard times. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting the heavy waves. And again, I want you to remember that there's more than one person who's recording this event. In the Gospel of Mark, again, what we learn is, and through the commentaries, is they were actually about halfway across the lake. And the lake, as it appears here, is actually the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is about seven miles wide. So they, were, they had been rowing, they had gotten about three and a half miles, a storm had come up, and rowing has become almost impossible. 
It's extremely difficult. And it says about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them, walking on the water. And again, sometimes we miss some things if we're not really paying attention. This verse actually translates, Jesus came to them in the fourth watch. There were four watches in the night. You had 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. You had 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. You had 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. And 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So it could have been as late as 6 a.m. Uh, this particular translation just uses the earliest time, which is 3 a.m. And this was no ordinary storm. When we read this storm, this is a supernatural storm. This is a big, violent storm. The disciples, they, they had been put into the boat on the first watch, which means they were put into the boat by Jesus between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. And when you read the commentary, what we find out is, is, or read the verses and study the verses and pay attention, we find it's probably closer to 6 p.m. when they got in the boat. Because it said Jesus dispersed the crowd, he then walked up onto a man and began to pray, and as he was praying, it got dark. And by 9 p.m., it would already have been dark. At 6 a.m., it had still been light. Jesus had some work to do. He had to climb a mountain. He had to let the crowds go. So a couple hours later, if you, you know, just looking at it, probably closer to 6 p.m. when they got into the boat. So what that means is they had been rowing for at least nine hours. Remember, on the way over, they crossed over. The crowds got there by walking before they got to the other side. So it's a pretty fast trip. But... Now they've been rowing for nine hours and they're only halfway across. And remember, Peter, Andrew, John, they were experienced fishermen. They knew the waters. They knew how to handle storm. And in that particular Sea of Galilee, storms came up quite often because it's surrounded by mountains. So unexpected storms came off and they had experienced this before. And you gotta try to imagine what's going through their mind. And the scriptures don't say this, but this 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 is what I believe was going on. I think they were actually fighting for their lives. If you've been rowing for nine hours, you're not just riding this storm out. You are fighting with everything you got in you to get through this storm. They knew if they didn't continue rowing, the boat would be tossed around so much that the boat and everybody in it would be lost. They were actually fighting for their lives. And put yourself in their boat. Well, put, this, put yourself in that boat. Think about what was going through their mind. I, I think all they can think about is surviving. They're so busy trying to handle their circumstances in their own power, they're forgetting to trust Jesus and His power. And have you ever felt that way? I, I mean, have you ever felt like you were a small boat in a big sea with the waves and the winds of life just beating and battering all around you? You're trying to get somewhere and you feel like you're just stuck in the middle? And all sorts of troubles going on around you. And all you have are the waves in life and they're pounding you. And you can't think about anything other than just surviving. How, how do I get out of this storm? It looks hopeless. It looks impossible. And you see, keep trying and trying and trying and you just don't get anywhere. You can't even find the time to figure out the solution. Because all you're doing is trying to keep your head above water. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been some times like that in my life. And I just keep thinking to myself, if I could just catch a break, if I could just get a couple hours away alone so I can figure out how to fix it, but I don't have time to do that because I'm just trying to keep my head above where I'm trying to keep from drowning. If I could just, if I could just find some time to think about this, I'd be able to get to the other side. But I can't because survival and I'm trusting in my own power to fix the problem. And I'm forgetting to trust in Jesus' problem. Or Jesus' power to fix my problem. Now that's what I ask yourself. Who sent that storm? Wasn't it God himself who sent the storm? And who put him in the boat and sent him out of the storm? Was it not Jesus himself? See, in order for Jesus, in order for God to test us. Sometimes he has to send a storm that is so big that we can't fix it on our own. The question is, do you trust Jesus in the storm or are you still trying to take care of it in your own power? There was a point in my life where we were battling for survival. 
for a couple of years in our business. And we kept working hard and we kept doing things in our own power. And we kept trying to say if we could just catch a break. And all we could see is what we had to do in the next five minutes just to survive. And one day, God made that storm so big that there was no way we could handle it. The test had come, and now we had to rely on Him. And it didn't turn out like I prayed. It didn't turn out like I hoped it had. What it did was turn out completely different, but a whole lot better. God's ways are always better than our ways. But again... We look at the story and we see the disciples are in the middle of the lake. They're three and a half miles away in the middle of a raging storm. And where's Jesus? He's up on a mountain praying. The disciples can't see Jesus. But when you look at the, the story in the Gospel of Mark, we know that Jesus saw the disciples. Mark writes in the, in the 48th verse of chapter 6, He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. And Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And I want you to know this. In the midst of the storm, you may not be able to see Jesus. Jesus sees you. He never takes His eyes off of you. Because our God is a God of compassion. And if He's the God of compassion, then we have to know that we can trust Him. And keep in mind, when Jesus showed up, the storm was still going on. The storm was raging all around them. Matthew, who was a disciple. Mark, who was a disciple. They were on the boat. That means they were eyewitnesses. They saw this. They experienced it. Matthew goes on to say, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. I, I, I love the transparency of the Bible, because if I wrote that, I'd be like, there were 12 of us in the boat. 11 of them were scared to death. But I stood, and I was brave. He doesn't say that. He said, we were all scared. We were all terrified. We thought it was a ghost coming towards us. So not only do you, do you trust Jesus in the storm when you can't see Him, do you trust Jesus in the storm when you don't even recognize Him? Here was Jesus walking towards them, a man they had spent years with. But in the storm, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the waves, they didn't recognize Him. If you're in a storm right now, maybe, just maybe, it's a test. And maybe the one who created the storm wants you to trust Him when you can't see Him. Or even when you don't recognize Him. And you may not be able to see Jesus. But let me assure you, Jesus sees you. According to these scriptures, He never takes His eyes off. It's the fourth watch. It's the watch right before the dawn. And as the saying goes, it's darkest before the dawn. Sometimes the test can, comes when the things are the darkest in your life. And I know some of the things that some of you are going through. Some of you are going through great big storms right now. Some of you are going through storms poor right now. And they're big storms. And the waves are pounding you. The wind has been beating on you, to you for a long time. It's the darkest hour of your life. And you may not be able to see Jesus. Maybe you are like the disciples and you're even terrified and you're crying out. But notice the God of compassion. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. The New International Version said, but Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage in His eye. Don't be afraid. When you're trying to get somewhere and you're stuck in the middle and there's a storm on all sides of you and there's a problem in life and it's hitting you like the winds and the waves on a rough sea and you're trying to get to the other side and you're not getting anywhere and you can't see Jesus and if you did see Jesus, you're not sure that you'd recognize Him. I want you to know He sees you. And he comes to you and he says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Don't get scared. Don't flip out. Just trust me. Are you trusting Jesus in your storm? And it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. 
The disciples had walked with Jesus for a long time. They had seen his miracles. They had seen what he could do. And yet they're still afraid. So take comfort if you're afraid that even the disciples were afraid. But Jesus comes to you and he says, I'm here. I'm with you. There's no need to be afraid because I am with you. One of the things I learned through this is sometimes, and this is what happened in my life, when you're in a storm, the very presence of God is revealed to you in a new way. The disciples didn't recognize Jesus. They were scared and they were crying out because as far as the record goes, Jesus had never come to them walking on water in the middle of the storm before. In the midst of the storm, Whatever you're going through, Jesus may reveal Himself to you in a new way. He may do something miraculous that you've never seen before or never heard of before. Because not only is our God a God of compassion, He is a God of miracles. And in the storm, He may come to you in a way that, that you don't notice, or you don't see, or you don't recognize. He may reveal Himself to you in a new way. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage in his eye, do not be afraid. In other words, trust me when the storm comes. Trust me in your darkest hour. Trust me when you're scared. Look for me. You may not see me, but I see you, and I may reveal myself to you in a new way. In that moment, when you're at your very weakest, the storm is at its very strongest, and the night is at its very darkest, you might get to experience Jesus in a new way. See, Jesus gives us the grace to get through whatever we're going through. He gives us the grace when we need it. And it might be the fourth watch in a storm at the darkest hour, but He is the God of compassion and He is the God of miracles. And He may come in a way you don't expect. And sometimes Jesus sends a storm so we may know that we cannot do it on our own. And when He does that, the unexpected ways of God may struggle. The unexpected ways of God may even frighten us. Sometimes Jesus is with us. And we don't even recognize Him. But take courage. Don't be afraid. He's trying to teach us in every situation, even in the impossible situations, to trust Him. And the storm that you're in right now, the storm that you're experiencing right now, may simply be a test to reinforce your trust in Him. Then Peter called to Him said, Lord, if it's really You, tell me to come to You, walking on the water. See, Peter knew Jesus. And Peter knew that Jesus just wasn't the God of compassion, but He was the God of miracles as well. And this is what I want you to know today. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. If you want to lead a miracle-filled life, you're going to have to get out of the boat. Yes, come, said Jesus. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Sometimes we need to sit back when we're going through a storm and we have to ask, do I truly trust Jesus in the middle of the storm? Do I trust Jesus? Not only in the middle of the storm, do I trust Jesus if I'm not sure I even recognize Him right now? And then you need to ask yourself, do I trust Jesus when He calls me out in the middle of the storm? It wasn't the most convenient time, was it, to walk on water? Because it's a whole lot easier to stay in the boat and be safe and let someone else lead the miracle filled life than it is for us to get out of the boat and lead a miracle filled life ourselves. But if you want to experience the God of miracles, if you want to experience the God of compassion, you have to step out in faith. You may have to leave the comfort of your boat. You may have to leave the security of your job and step out of faith. You may have to leave the security of your family and friends and step out in faith. You may have to leave the security of your pew, of your chair, and step out in faith. But you can't lead the miracle-filled life sitting in a pew or sitting in a metal chair. You can't do it from there. You have to get up and step out of the boat. Do you trust God enough to step out in faith and do the impossible? Because when God calls you sometimes, it doesn't make sense. Some guy 
God calls you to step out on faith, it doesn't make any sense. Walking on water doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Try it. Most of us are sinning. Do you trust Jesus as He asks you to step out into the deep waters? Do you trust Jesus when He asks you to step out in faith and get out of the boat in the middle of the storm? Because Peter was about to get into a situation that was literally over his head. Commentaries say that the Sea of Galilee, at about the middle where they were, was 150 feet deep. And yet Peter stepped over the side of the boat. In a situation that was completely over his head, in the middle of the storm, and began to live the miracle life. And you may be safe in the boat, but you can't walk on water sitting in a boat. And it's like a friend of mine, or something that I heard years ago, he said, I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat sitter any day. Because I can't experience the miracle filled life sitting in a boat. God is a God of miracles. And he's called us to do great things, but we can't do them just sitting in a chair somewhere. We've got to get up and go out to live the miracle-filled life. And when does God call Peter to step out into the world? I mean, was it on a calm day with the sunshine on a glassy lake? No. I mean, this, this wasn't a calm day in the park in a kiddie pool. This was the most inconvenient time to step out of the boat and do a miracle and live the miracle full, full of life. It was the darkest hour of the night. It was the middle of a raging sea. The wind and the waves were pounding them. The water was deep. Peter was in over his head. He was three and a half miles from shore. He was exhausted. He'd been rowing for nine straight hours. Not exactly the best conditions to step out of the boat and walk on water, was it? So if you're going through a storm and you feel like Jesus is calling you to do something, unless your situation is worse than Peter's, and I, I don't know how that's even possible, when Jesus calls, you should go. Do you trust Him to do the impossible with your life? And again, Jesus has shown us on our own resources, we cannot do it. There are some situations that are impossible. It's impossible to walk on water. But when we trust Jesus in the middle of a storm, and when we trust Jesus as He calls us to step out of a boat and do the impossible, we can lead a miracle-filled life. Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. And sometimes, you know, we think Peter sort of gets a bad rap, don't he? But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sing, Save me, Lord, he exclaimed. You know, there's some people that say, and I've read and I've heard that Peter was impulsive. He was reckless. You know, that may be true. Peter is the only other person that history records that's ever walked on water besides Jesus. Can you trust Jesus when you're in the middle of the storm? Can you trust Jesus when He calls you to get out of the boat in the middle of the storm? Can you trust Jesus when He calls you to do the impossible? Can you trust Jesus when you're in over your head and you begin to sink? When the situation looks hopeless, what do most of us do? Most of us, including me, I've been there. Most of us simply take our eyes off of Jesus just like Peter did. We begin to look at our circumstances. We begin looking at the winds and the waves of life. We look at the storm. We look at our problems. We look to the waves. And we're afraid. And what do we do? We begin to sing. We, we begin to cry out. The same thing Peter did. When you're in a storm of our time, what we do is we cry out, Lord, save me. When the situation looks hopeless, don't we call on the name of the Lord? Because this is what I found out. Sinking times or praying times. Sinking times or praying times. Peter's faith, Peter's trust began to waver when he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to look at his circumstances. Peter had to learn he couldn't do the impossible on his own. And Jesus wouldn't do the impossible unless Peter invited him in. Unless Peter called out to him. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why do you doubt me? And again, I, I think as Peter climbed back into that boat, what did Peter focus on? Did Peter focus on the fact that he failed, or did Peter focus on the fact that at least for a little while he walked on water? 
And the scripture doesn't lead us in any direction at all. It doesn't tell us. But I think there's probably a little bit of both. I think as Peter remembered the words of Jesus, you have little faith. Why did you doubt me? I think he was probably a little upset with himself. But after that had worn off and Peter got thinking about the fact that he scrolled over. He had stepped out into the middle of a raging sea at the darkest hour and lived a miracle-filled life. He walked on water. I think he had to rejoice a little bit. I think he had to think, you know what? Uh -uh. At least for a little while, I got to do and be involved in a miracle. You know, maybe, maybe you're like me, you know, you had a test in your life and you failed it this week. Or, or maybe there was another time in your life and there was a big test and you know it from God and you failed it. Because I know I failed a lot of tests that have been sent in my life. But here's what we have a choice. We can focus on our failure or we can start to prepare for the next test because you know there's another test coming. We can focus on our failure or we can begin to focus on what miracles God has already done in our life. You just have to ask yourself as you're going on, what is my focus? Am I focusing on the failure? Or am I focusing on the, the miracles that God has provided in the past? Am I focusing on the failure? Or am I preparing for the next test? Because I can promise you, there's another test coming. And you think about this. You know, so often we say, Peter sank because he didn't trust Jesus. But if we read that, Peter didn't sink because he didn't trust Jesus. He was on the way to trust in Jesus. He had enough trust in Jesus to step over the boat. But when the storm got a little heavier, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sin. He began to put his focus on the wrong thing. So if you fail a test, take heart. Some of the greatest men in Scripture failed their test. It's what you focus on next that's going to be important. All you have to do you're in the middle of a test and things look impossible. It's called out on the name of Jesus. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Jesus said, why did you doubt me? Verse 32 and 33. When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God. On our own, we cannot get out of the storm that Jesus has sent to test us. Without calling on him, Jesus will not calm the storm that He sent to test us. But when we call on Jesus and we're in union with Him, Jesus will take us by the hand. He'll get out of the boat, come and put us back in the boat with us, and together there is nothing that we can't do, and He will calm the storm. But notice, He doesn't do it for our sake. He does it for the people around us so that we can glorify God the Father, so that they too may begin to see Jesus and be able to trust Him. Then the disciples worshipped Him and said, You truly are the Son of God. A lot of times, not only is He trying to test us so that we can learn to trust Him, but He wants us to glorify His Father so that others can see that He truly is the Son of God. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but this much I do know, you're either in the middle of a storm, you're just coming out of a storm, or you're getting ready to head into the storm. Maybe somebody in here today is saying, well, the, the weather's clear right now. I, I, I'm not having a lot of problems right now. Things are good right now. I just want you to hold on, because sooner or later, there'll be a storm that'll come. And in the count of the lows, Jesus is trying to teach His disciples, still trying to teach us, to trust Him. In the account of Lowe's, God shows us that He's the God of compassion. He showed us that He was the God of miracles. He showed us that He was the God of abundance. And in the test, He shows us that on our own, with our own limited resources, we can't do what He calls us to do. Without us giving Him what we have, He will not do what He's called us to do. But when we take our limited power with His infinite power and we come together, there's nothing impossible that we can't do. And what we are called to do is to live a miracle-filled life. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves you and He loves me and He loved them too much not to test us. He wants to see if we've learned the lesson that He's wanted us to learn. So He tests us by sending a storm. And He may be the God of compassion in the test. He's the God of compassion in the storm. And we may not be able to see Him, but He never takes His eyes off of us. On our own, we cannot do what He calls us to do. And without 
us getting out of the boat and calling on Him, especially in the middle of a stormy sea at the darkest hours in our circumstances, He may not do what we know He can do. But when we come together with Him, there is nothing that's impossible with God. Because not only is our God a God of compassion, He is a God of miracles. And we cannot on our own walk on water. We sink. But when we call out to Jesus, He calls us out of the boat to walk on the water. It's not, in, it's not even possible to keep God's commands. Sometimes I think we get confused over why God gave us the Ten Commandments. We, we, we so often, and we've heard and teach in churches, taught in churches before, that God gave us the Ten Commandments so we have this bunch of rules that we have to live by. But in the New Testament, Paul says, God gave us the Ten Commandments so we know we couldn't follow the rules, so that we would know our need of a Savior. If we could save ourselves, if we could follow all the rules, we wouldn't need Jesus, would we? God's not only the God of compassion, He's the God of miracles. We can't keep God's commands without the help of Jesus. On our own, we cannot, without us calling on Him, He will not, but together, our limitations of His infinite power, we can get out of the boat, we can live a miracle-filled life. But not only is Jesus God of miracles, and not only is God a God of compassion... We saw that in the loaves and the fish. We also saw that he was the God of abundance, didn't he? They had more left over after everyone was satisfied. It's not after everybody had a little bit to eat, but after everybody was satisfied, they had more left over than what they started. In the test, we see that, that Jesus sees us in the storm. He, he's the God of compassion. In the test, Peter walks on water. We see that Jesus is a God of miracles, but he's not just the God of one miracle. He's the God of abundant miracles. He's the God of abundance. Jesus had just provided a miracle in the disciples' life by the feeding of the 5,000 with two, two fish and five loaves. Then He provides another miracle. He walks out onto the water to them. Then He provides another miracle. He calls Peter to walk on the water with Him. Then He provides another miracle. Peter calls out to Him before Peter's head can even hit the water. He's grabbed them and saved him. Then he provides another miracle, according to the Gospel of Mark. As soon as Jesus got into the boat, the wind stopped, the waves stopped, the water became calm. And then he provides even another miracle. Mark says that as soon as Jesus got in the boat, immediately they were to the other side. They've been rowing nine hours and only got three and a half miles. Jesus steps in the boat and immediately to their own other side. So not only is God a God of compassion? And not only is God a God of miracles, He's a God of abundant miracles. And we can trust Him. That's the lesson and the test. The lesson is to teach us the test is so that we can know our own hearts to see if we truly do trust Jesus. Do you truly trust Jesus in every and all situation? Do you trust Him in the storms when the waves are over your head? Because I want you to know this. The waves of the storm may be over your head, but they're still under the feet of Jesus. Do you trust Jesus when He calls you to do the impossible? Not when it's convenient, but when you step out of the storm, no matter what the circumstances. How do I know if I'm out of the boat? How do you know if you're out of the boat? The answer to that question is, what are you doing in your life right now without the supernatural power of Jesus you could do? What are you doing in your life right now without Jesus it would be impossible to do? Do you trust Him when you begin to sink? Do you trust Him when you're in the middle of the storm? Do you trust Him when you can't see the end and the winds and the storms are beating up all around you? Do you trust Him when it's the darkest hour of the night? Do you trust Him when you're in over your head. Do you trust Him when you were leading the miracle life? And now you're just trying to survive. Your circumstances are such you can't even see Jesus because of the storm. You don't recognize Him even though you know He's right there with you. But you're beginning to sink. Do you trust Him then? And I know some of you are in a test right now. Jesus sent a storm. He wants you to know without Him, you cannot. And without you, He will not. But if you truly trust Him, if you'll call on His name, He'll calm the winds when you trust Him. Let me, know, let me tell you this. You know, sometimes the message 
It's preached in such a way that God just calms the storm and makes it go away. He doesn't always do that. Sometimes he lets the storm rage and calms you. But either way, it's okay. Because you're in the calm waters again. Here's the problem I believe the disciples had. It's the same problem I have so often. See, we know God is a God of compassion. We know that. We know God is a God of miracles. We know that. We know God is a God of abundance. We know that. But we haven't transferred that knowledge into our own lives. The question isn't whether you trust Jesus. The question is do you trust Jesus in your life? See, the disciples knew that Jesus was a God of compassion. They had experienced His compassion. They had seen it. They knew Jesus was the God of miracles. They had seen His miracles. They had experienced it. They knew God was the God of abundance. They had seen His abundance. They had experienced it. They just hadn't transferred it into His life, into their life. They knew that God was the God of compassion, the God of miracles, and the God of abundance in everybody else's life. They just weren't sure if He was the God of miracles in their life. See, we know that, don't we? We know that Jesus is a God of compassion. We know that He's the God of miracles. We know that He's the God of abundance. But do we believe that He's the God of miracles, the God of compassion, the God of abundance in our very own lives? We trust Him to do work in everybody else's life. Do we trust Him to do work in our life? Have you transferred that knowledge into your own life so that you can live the miracle-filled life? On our own, we can't calm some storms. Without your invitation, Jesus is not going to calm some storm, but when you invite Him into your storm, He will calm the storm and He'll calm you. Either way, it's okay because you're at the feet of Jesus and you're calm. I think to myself, because I know I'm so guilty of this, what if I truly trusted Jesus to be as big as He really is? What if I came to Jesus and I, and I was honest and I said, Jesus, you know, I, I have to let you know I've been rowing my head off. I've been rowing and rowing and rowing and I just can't do it on my own. I need you to step in and take care of this. I need you to perform a miracle in my life. What would your life be? How would you live if you truly trusted Jesus to do the impossible in your life? you're not fully trusting Jesus, bring your little faith to the altar. See me after the service. She said, you have so little faith. Why do you doubt me? Just bring that little faith up here to the altar. Bring your doubt to the altar. Bring it here. Call on the name of the Lord. If you failed a test recently, are you going to focus on that one test? Or are you going to start preparing for the next test? If you fail a test reason, are you going to focus on that one test or are you going to start thinking about it and focusing on the miracles that God has already done in your life? Come to your altar. Reach out your hand and say, Lord, save me. Let Him lift you up. Here's one thing I see in this. I, I, I think this story is it's a, just a great picture of salvation. It's a great illustration of salvation. Do you trust Jesus with your salvation? Do you trust Jesus to take away your sin? Because you can't do it on your own. But if you call on Jesus to me, he takes you by the hand, he lifts you up, he takes you out of the deepness of your sin and he saves you. You can't save yourself from the judgment of God. You can't save yourself from the wrath of God because of those sins. But Jesus can. But he won't do it without you. When you call on Jesus in all your insufficiency, He reaches out your hand and He saves you from the wrath of God. And why does He do that? Because we serve a God of compassion. Because we serve a God of miracles. Because we serve a God of abundance. We all know that, but have we transferred it into our lives? God is the God of compassion in my life and God is the God of compassion in your life. God is the God of miracles in my life and God is the God of miracles in your life. God is the God of abundance in my life and God is the God of abundance in your life. But do you believe that this morning? Do you trust Jesus in the test? Do you trust Jesus in the storm? 
Do you trust Jesus when he calls you to get out of the boat in the middle of the boat? Do you trust Jesus to live a miracle-filled life? Do you trust Jesus even when you begin to sink? Because the lesson is to trust Jesus. And the test is, have I learned to trust Jesus even when the situation looks impossible? Have I learned to trust Jesus in my own life? It's easy to trust Jesus in somebody else's life. But have you learned to trust Him in your life? Jesus is the God of compassion. Not in somebody else's life, but in your life. And Jesus is the God of miracles. Not in somebody else's life, but in your life. And Jesus is the God of abundance. Not in somebody else's life, but in your life. Jesus is the God of abundance. And you can trust Him even when the situation looks impossible. The lesson, trust Jesus. The test is, do I trust Jesus even when it looks impossible? The question to you is, can you or will you pass the test? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these valuable lessons that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for being the God of compassion. That even at the times in our life when it's so hard to see you because the storms that are raging around us, that you never take your eyes off of us. And Lord, we thank you that you're the God of miracles. And no matter what, when we invite you in, your word assures us that nothing is impossible with God. And Father, we thank you, the God of abundance. Father, forgive us when we think abundance means a whole bunch of money in the bank. And that abundance, when we look at it from a heavenly standpoint, it's us showing the world Jesus so that we glorify you. Father, we just ask for those today that are going through a storm. And I look around this room, and I know some of these aren't some of these people in here aren't going through a storm. They're going through storms, plural. We would ask you, Lord, that, that they just trust you to do the impossible no matter what. Father, we love you, and we come to you today. And Lord, we just ask that you would reveal to us, reveal yourself to us. And sometimes, Lord, reveal yourself to us in a new way, a way that we can't even imagine. And Father, we ask this in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As, as we close out, I, I want you know, I'm, I'm here if you need to talk, um, if you need to see anything uh, or talk to me. But I, I saw this, uh, John Hayden put something out on either Twitter or Facebook on, on Sunday. I thought it was so appropriate for this message. He said, I, I, God will not use anyone until he puts them through a storm. God will not use anyone until he puts them through a storm. And the greater your storm, the greater your mission. So if you're going through a storm right now, know that God may have a great mission for you because he loves you, because he has compassion, because he's a God of miracles and a God of abundance. I would like you to come back. Don't miss next week. I, I, I do think that Thankful for the Thorns is one of those special messages that God uh, sometimes gives even His weakest people. And, and I, I think that if you have somebody in your life right now that maybe this time of year is a sad time of year, that, that you ask them to come out to it. I think they'll be encouraged by it. Then come out Thursday night and join us as we... Um, Watch movies together. We're going to try to continue to do that throughout the year. Every Thursday night is going to be movie night. So until next week, uh, if you're headed into a storm, or maybe you're already in a storm, invite Jesus to come into the storm with you so you can fill, lead the miracle-filled life. And if, if things are good right now, spend time with Jesus so that you know Him, so that you can trust Him when the storm comes. May the peace of the Lord be upon you. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. God bless you all. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you next week. You're dismissed. God bless you.